Welcome back. In part two, we continue our discussion by looking at how the women were perceived and received within Thelema. Manon explains her term proximal authority and how this relates to Leah, Jane, and Marjorie. We then move to how the women were discussed in the media, their reception outside of the official organization, the legacy of each of the women, and their impact and influence on our culture. Uh, the claims that uh, that the women made, uh, for mm-hmm. example, uh, Leia claiming to be the, I guess the the uh, the vessel for the the goddess Babylon, because mm-hmm. she she called herself that. Did she ever rescind that title? She rescinded Scarlet Woman, but mm-hmm. did she ever stop considering herself? No. Babylon? Not formally, um, not formally, explicitly uh, in any of the source materials that I have seen. I in the letter in in these letters, um, the nineteen twenty nine one is very brief, but the nineteen twenty seven letter where she kind of recounts her support of Crowley. There's, she makes some sort of statement about all of the magical vows that I've made to you are, are defunct, basically. So that could be interpreted mm. along those lines, I guess. Uh, one of the things as well that she did that was very important while she and Crowley were, were lovers and magical partners is that she, they, conducted, um, they conducted a ceremony where she was proclaimed Babylon incarnate, where he was... Uh, present as well. This happened around the same time that Crowley began his initiation into the, the Epsissimus degree, which is the highest degree of AA, which she presided over. So in terms of the fact that she she was initially proclaimed Babylon in his presence, maybe that kind of general statement in 1927 could be interpreted as her also kind of withdrawing that title but she doesn't formally explicitly say, and also I am no right. longer Babylon. Like right. there's, there's nothing that yeah. explicit. That mm. whole dynamic between those two, I find that to be very interesting, the, how she mm. kept challenging mm. his authority yeah. and yeah. he didn't take well to that and kept challenging hers no. and that, that back no. and forth. That is, is fascinating, yeah. fascinating. Mm. But in, in terms of also um, with, uh, Jane uh, Wolf, mm-hmm. although she wasn't mm-hmm. a Scarlet Woman, uh, mm-hmm. the the I, I from what I understand, she had a, a pretty large role in in transmitting the teachings of yeah. the Lima, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and then Marjorie's uh, claims of being perhaps a vessel of of Babylon mm-hmm. herself. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. I, where where I'm kind of I think where my mind is going with these questions is. Mm-hmm. How were the people, the members within uh, Thelema, how were they receiving this? Did they, did they accept this? And it, was this, it, was this a struggle on the women's parts to to mm-hmm. uh, uphold these claims? Mm-hmm. And I guess where where I'm where I'm coming from with this, and I'm asking uh, specifically, is in reference mm-hmm. to your term proximal authority that you use mm-hmm. in your article. Mm-hmm. About Leah mm-hmm. Herzig, uh, the title is Proximal Authority, the Changing Role of Leah Herzig in Alistair mm-hmm. Crowley's Thelema. And I will make sure, I believe this is open access, isn't it? This, yes. Yes, yes okay. it is. I will yes. make sure to, mm-hmm. to include that in the program notes. Mm-hmm. But I'm asking these questions really with that in mm. mind, because yeah. that was a very interesting uh, perspective that, y- that I think mm-hmm. that you've I think is interesting mm. perspective that you mm. have uh, uh, introduced. Mm. So if if maybe you could talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, definitely. That's that's a really really important question. And just to to summarize for um, the, I'm sure everyone who listens will have studied the article and memorized the terminology. Of course. Uh, 
But <laughs> of course. Uh, <laughs> but if anyone hasn't read it, uh, no. Just to just to briefly summarize. So so the the main argument. What I'm doing in that article is I'm using uh, Max Weber's. Um, typology of authority to to understand the early Hellenic movement and um so Weber talks about charismatic authority which is kind of the you know paradigmatic religious prophet founder type of authority the uh, the person who is charismatic authority is seen as kind of chosen by the gods or as exceptional or special or as having particular abilities that no one else has and then he talks about traditional authority which is kind of like um the Pope or the Lama system in, in Tibet, where um, authority is conferred via time-honored custom or, or at least the idea that this is ancient custom and, and kind of ancient rituals um, for transmitting power. And finally, Weber talks about uh, rational legal authority, which is kind of characteristic of modern bureaucracies where we don't, uh, the authority doesn't emanate from the person so much as from from an office. So the vice chancellor of a university, for instance, would be a good example of that. And what I add to this is what I'm calling proximal authority, which I define as authority that is ascribed to or enacted by a person based on their closeness to the primary leader, their real or perceived closeness to the primary leader. And uh, that's important as well, because what matters more than the actual closeness is you know, do other people in the same milieu see this person as as being close to the leader? So, um, so, so looking at like historical examples of this, if we go to early modern European monarchies, for instance, there's quite a, a common recurrence of, of this sort of concept of the king's or the queen's favorite, who's this mm. this person who is. Uh, really, really close to the monarch and has a disproportionate amount of power through that uh, that position. And this is also something that recurs in in religious movements quite um, quite broadly. And I thought this uh, with with kind of you maybe you have the primary leader who has charismatic or traditional authority, but there's quite often also one or several sort of secondary leaders who might not who don't necessarily have independent charisma and who don't necessarily have a very sort of formalized position either, but they have a lot of influence by virtue of being the chosen confidant of the the primary leader and others seeing them as kind of an emissary or or maybe thinking that they have access to to secret knowledge or, or privileged insight that other members of the movement don't have. Or maybe they think, you know, I better stay on good terms with with this person because this is the loved one of uh, the leader of the movement. So I better not um, upset them. And I thought that was an interesting way to to look at Leah Hersig's changing role in terms of she has an incredibly influential position as Crowley's Scarlet Woman. And it is clear that that was not only an effect of that office in itself because she was a lot more powerful than most of the previous Scarlet Women and she was a lot more um, esoterically involved as well in terms of having her own magical practice and having an interest in in sort of being involved in the workings of the Thelemic movement for a number of uh, a number of years but it's also very clear that this position was something that um, she couldn't really uh, claim independently in the context of that movement, it was dependent on Crowley's approval. And up until that point, that had been kind of the the custom with, with the Scarlet Women. And it hadn't, uh, in terms of the previous Scarlet Women, that hadn't really presented a problem either. When, when Crowley stopped seeing uh, his first wife, Rose Kelly, as his Scarlet Woman, that was um, that was quite quite some time had passed since their relationship had deteriorated. And uh, in terms of some of the others who held that title in between Rose and Leia, they were not they were not at all involved in Thelema to the extent that Hersey was, and uh, don't seem to have been very you know not as concerned with that title or, or, or really as concerned when it was taken away from them as well. That was kind of just the thing, um, how it worked. Crowley was kind of the prophet of the Lima and the Scarlet Woman was the, the woman that he chose to, to be in that title. 
But with uh, with Leah, we have someone who's very involved, who's very invested. She's studied the system extensively, and that title gets taken away from her. And it's clear that um, mostly the other Thalamites accepted this. They didn't really um, they didn't really challenge Crowley's. Uh, Decision. There are a few passages in um, Jane Wolfe's earlier diaries where she's sort of uh, she's sort of pondering this as well, and she says this is from one of her Chaffalu diaries. She says something along the lines of, you know, shouldn't shouldn't the Scarlet Woman be kind of equal to uh, to the Beast? So Crowley, um, should she really be kind of um, should he be able to to depose her? Or, or something like that. But there's no indication that she really challenged Crowley's decision. We, he actually did decide to to pass the torch uh, to Dorothy Olsen. So, so Leia's various proclamations of being, of being Babylon um, and, and various other things as well. Like she tried to, first she said when, when, when Crowley made this decision that, you know, we need to have a ceremony of the passing of the torch. So, uh, the three of us need to convene and you need to ritually do this to, to create the magical link. And Crowley didn't care. Mm. He didn't show up. Um, he was off with his new lover and focused on that. Yes. So then Leia says, well, you know, maybe maybe we don't need to have this ceremony. Maybe me deliberately just passing on the torch to Dorothy Olsen, maybe that's enough. And that seems to be this kind of um, attempt at a compromise on her part because actually in terms of the movement, in terms of what the other Thelemites are accepting as, as kind of the hierarchy of power, Crowley is at the top of it and she can't really, she, when she's no, like ironically, when she's no longer the Scarlet Woman, she doesn't have the power to mm. challenge him either. But being in the office of Scarlet Woman, that is dependent on his approval. So that's that's kind of what I'm um, terming this proximal authority here. When when she's perceived in the eyes of the movement as his chosen one and as uh, the, the the closest person to him, she has a tremendous amount of power. But when that relational proximity decreases, then she's also less able to um, command others within that movement. Um, and I also think that that's, uh, I think, I think that that's really crucial in, in terms of, um, in terms of kind of the hierarchy of, of, um, of authority there is that Crowley, I mean, Crowley often relied on, uh, the Scarlet Women, but he also, I mean, he also undertook magical, um, experiments with, with male partners, of course, and, and sex magical experiments as well. And he he often relied on other people to uh, to channel messages for him or to to help him interpret uh, philemic doctrinal passages of his own writings. But of course, he is the the prophet of the movement, so he's in charge of whose interpretations kind of and, and whose messages and whose visions kind of uh, make the, the cut in terms of um, informing the movement. It's also in, in terms of in terms of Cameron's various um, various sort of uh, uh, suspicions about uh, her own role and her her idea about maybe being being the Scarlet Woman or maybe being Babylon as well. It's uh, it's it's interesting because uh, of course when she was corresponding she was corresponding with Jane Wolfe uh, towards the end of of Jane's life and and Cameron is still uh, is still quite young. But uh, to, to, from what I can see, Jane Wolfe was at the very least intrigued by Cameron's ideas about possibly being this kind of prophesized um, uh, divine divine woman who's going to appear. She wasn't um, she wasn't unconvinced. Uh, she was mm. definitely uh, she was definitely interested, and she was definitely curious about what had gone on during uh, the Babylon working. That seems to have been the case for, um, for Carl Germer as well, who was, uh, who'd been Crowley's sort of representative in the United States and who uh, succeeded Crowley as, uh, as the head of the OTO as well and who often comes off a bit as kind of a, a sort of straight and, and square guy who doesn't really tolerate much nonsense. But 
he was also at least intrigued, it seems, by 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 Cameron's ideas, because at this time, Wolf Jane is is corresponding with with Cameron, and she's corresponding very closely with Carl Germer as well, and sort of passing messages a little bit. But um, around this time that Cameron was uh, living in the desert and having these visions, the the OTO in the United States was kind of very much sort of declining and and uh, and really evaporating and, and kind of led more or less a dormant existence for for quite a few years after that. So she wasn't really, you know, she wasn't she wasn't active within any of Crowley's orders right. in that way. And 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 I think there were mixed views. She went to to stay for a while with uh, with Wilfred Smith, who'd been the old head of the Agape Lodge, and his. Uh, his wife, Helen Parsons Smith, who'd been Jack Parsons' first wife, and they thought Cameron was a bit out there and uh, probably a bit crazy as well. So yeah. different uh, different opinions, right. definitely. Mm. I was also curious as to uh, Dorothy's reaction to the, the the passing of the torch, as it were, and mm. Leah's mm-hmm. claims of... Dorothy being her magical daughter, uh, mm-hmm. et cetera, all, the, all those things that you that you had mentioned. How, mm-hmm. Did is there any um, indication? Uh, did Dorothy keep a, a diary of her own, or did other people write mm-hmm. anything about this in letters? Mm-hmm. How Dorothy mm-hmm. reacted to that? Um, from what I can tell, she wasn't very impressed. Uh, a lot of these things that Leia wrote down, she didn't actually. She didn't actually send all of it to Dorothy or, or Crowley either. She was uh, more, I think, discussing it with Norman Mudd and, and trying to to work things out for herself. But they had a little bit of a, a strained relationship, even though even though Leia came to Tunis in in twenty five to help them. From that time. Um, Dorothy was undergoing all of these visions and Leia and uh, this other guy who became the father of, of Leia's second son, Baron, they helped in these uh, in these visions and to, to transcribe and to direct things. But there seems to have been some jealousy there uh, on, on Dorothy's part towards uh, towards Leia and Dorothy's and, and Crowley's relationship was quite sort of tempestuous from what I can see as well. She drank quite a lot and there was there was some mental some mental illness there as well. Um or or what we might call mental illness mm-hmm. today, I think at least. She was kind of um unpredictable at, at various times. They were um in, in the summer of nineteen twenty five, um Crowley and, and Dorothy and Leia and Norman Mudd and and a couple of others, Carl Germa among them, they, they all gathered in, in Vida in Germany for this um, gathering of, of occult leaders where, where Crowley and his followers were there to um, defend Crowley's position essentially. And they're all staying they're all staying in the same house, more or less, and there was a lot of tension and, and from that time we have letters between uh, between various of, of, of these characters who were there and also from the years after um, describing how Dorothy lashes out at Leia and she, she feels that she shouldn't be there and that Crowley shouldn't have any contact with the previous uh, the previous Scarlet Woman, essentially. So there was... Um, there was some tension there and I think, uh, I think understandably... Understandably so. I think that Leia was really quite sort of. She had some big shoes to fill in terms of her sort of uh, involvement and uh, and kind of uh, contribution to uh, to Thelema as well. So yeah. so yes. Mm. Well, from what you've just explained, that I, I guess you could deduce that Dorothy didn't really take it very seriously if she didn't really want Leia mm. around. So. No. No, um, exactly. No. Yeah, interesting. I was just curious mm. as to how the other woman in this in this regard would, yeah. <laughs> uh, would be receiving that type of news. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Well, you mentioned about uh, Marjorie, how she was basically separated from the quote unquote group organization because mm-hmm. she was you know mm-hmm. by herself a lot of times, or she was with a, mm-hmm. uh, other artists, etc. Mm-hmm. But the other women, um, were these women open about their interest and their endeavors mm. with people mm-hmm. outside of Thelema? 
Was this something hmm. that was talked about? Hmm. And I don't know if there's hmm. any way that you can find hmm. this out, but I'm curious yes. to know. Yes, I mean, definitely, absolutely. I mean, uh, both uh, both Leigh and Jane, for a number of years, this was their whole life. Um, this was what they did. So that was very much... Uh, that was very much something that was out in the open and and which was which was a bit troublesome for them as well there are some there are some really interesting letters between leia and her she has uh, she has a friend who's back in the united states for instance but also there's some correspondence between her and uh, and some of her sisters where it's it's quite clear that they don't really they don't really understand right. what she's done. And it's very kind of, I mean, and this was, this was sort of a bohemian family. And at least, at least one of the other, the other Hersig uh, sisters did have kind of some sort of connection to esotericism of her own. She was active as a numerologist for a while. And so, so yeah. it probably wasn't something that was entirely out of the ordinary, but in terms of, um, quitting your job and, and skipping off to Europe and living in this commune with this man who calls himself the Great Beast 666 and calling yourself the Scarlet Woman. A bit they confusing. didn't entirely <laughs> understand <laughs> what she was doing with that. Um, and yes, definitely in terms of um, of Jane Wolfe as well. I mean, this was her whole this was her whole life for a number of years, and she was also she also represented Crowley or, or tried at least to, to liaise with the press, as I said earlier, in, in connection to Raoul Loveday's death as well. And that yeah. that was quite problematic for both, or actually for all three women in in, in different ways. This kind of I mean, the fact that Thelema, when it emerged, was a very sort of fringy movement. I mean, Crowley, um, despite having been brought up in this quite sort of bourgeois environment, of course, was a very colourful character. And he was, I mean, he was absolutely hounded by the tabloids for um, for years and years. And, and around this time with also the year before Raoul Loveday died, so 1922, Crowley wrote his Diary of a Drug Fiend, which he which he dictated to Leia, which is this kind of um, this story of, of, of drug use and kind of recovery through the principles of Thelema and features this sort of thinly veiled, fictionalized Abbey of Thelema with all of the real life characters who were there. And that was that was very poorly received. And um, and Crowley was sort of hung out to dry in the tabloids and as were the other women at the Abbey. So the Sunday Express, for instance, published this article without mentioning names where it said that Crowley kept three mistresses that he forced to prostitute themselves on the street of Palermo. And these three women were, and, and, and it was said that one of them was a silent film actress and one of them was a school teacher. So that was Jane and Leah. And one of them was a French governess. And that was uh, another of the women who was staying at the Abbey, Nina Shumway, who was uh, also um, Crowley's lover. And this, this wasn't true, but this was kind of characteristic of uh, the very sort of kind of sensationalized media portrayal of um uh, of of some fringy religious movements around this time. There was this idea of um, charismatic male leaders or gurus. There was also a bit of Orientalism thrown into this kind of luring innocent women into, into sex cults and into sex trafficking. There was also um, some very sensationalized series of articles across the Atlantic back in the US which feature... Crowley in a turban, um, speaking in a in a strange Indian dialect. This is I'm paraphrasing, but something like that. And, and all these women being um, entranced and uh, layers featured quite heavily in these articles. Um, alternative, like alternatingly, as first she's kind of an innocent victim who becomes beguiled by him. Then she's this very um, sexy, tempting, um, seductress, priestess figure. And it's all very, um, and it's all, it's, it, and it's very kind of, uh, it's very sort of eroticized. It's very, ooh, scandal, that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. um, and that kind of happened to Jane Wolfe as well when she went to England to liaise with the press. She got hung out to dry in the tabloids as this temptress who was trying to lure people to the abbey so um 
So they weren't treated very kindly by the media at all. And I think that actually um, that is more the case uh, for Crowley's female followers than it was for his male followers. I mean, Crowley himself received most of it, but uh, the women, I think, were very sort of, that was very titillating to the um, the British and American tabloid readership. So they they got more of the, as is the case today mm-hmm. uh, in, in many ways, I think. And uh, I mean, definitely in terms of Cameron as well, this kind of, um, this image that she had, that kind of galvanized her status uh, in the in the LA artistic bohemian underground avant-garde, this people knowing that she had been uh, at the Agape Lodge and she had been with Jack Parsons and in the Babylon working. But she was also, like in terms of the art that she created, she was very kind of on the cutting edge of of things. So one of the things that happened, she uh, she was kind of in this circle around uh, this artist Wallace Berman and his journal Seminar, which uh, featured her, which is um, in the fifties, featured her on the cover, and he he exhibited a drawing by her, which is called POT Vision, which shows. Uh, a woman on all fours being penetrated from behind by this kind of masculine spirit entity. And that caused, uh, this was in 1957, that caused the uh, the LAPD to raid the Fierce Gallery where Berman was exhibiting and shut things down uh, because they thought her drawing was obscene. Mm. Um, so she was... Uh, so she definitely experienced this uh, this kind of tension with uh, with surrounding society as well, and she vowed not to exhibit her art publicly after this uh, after this happened, mm-hmm. and she was treated in this way. But and and of course she's been um, receiving hugely more recognition after her death as as an artist as well, which is really that's a whole story in itself, yeah. which is really fabulous. Also, mm. yeah, and she has. Uh, I think that people that have no knowledge of her uh, her activities mm. within uh, mm. Thelema and her occult uh, mm. activities. I mean, she was in uh, in films as well. Uh, mm. That yeah. I mean, I guess. Well, I don't know. Maybe I should take that back. The films that she, mm. that she uh, took part in were. Uh, mm. Kenneth Anger film, so I guess Kenneth Anger wouldn't right. be considered just a mainstream <laughs> filmmaker yeah, either. But for sure, yeah. But, but she, I mean, she, she also, does have a, a name for herself. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And she also starred with uh, with Dennis Hopper in, in Curtis Harrington's Night Tide. So that's right. Okay. I guess at least, yeah, probably a little bit more far mm-hmm. removed mm-hmm. from uh, from right. things. But definitely, and and I mean, she's definitely also kind of in this. Um, category of of uh of female occult artists mm-hmm. from the 20th century who've okay. been uh and and of course she's not had she's not had the same she's not had the same recognition that that someone like leonora carrington or remedius varro yeah. have had and it's it, you know it's a, it's a different style mm-hmm. uh to some extent but but which is also I mean, her art, I think, is absolutely amazing. Yes. And it's really been, yeah, and it's really been in recent years mm-hmm. that that's, that's come into the public spotlight. But she, I mean, she created art and also poetry. I mean, she was also a poet. So she, I mean, she continued to to, to write and to paint throughout her whole life. And to that was really, I mean, those were really powerful mediums for her to explore uh, occultism and, yeah. and, and magic as well. Marjorie, uh, her medium was art, poetry, mm-hmm. uh, but as far as any type of important teachings or principles or concepts, did the women who, who were, were speaking about, did they have anything mm-hmm. that they wanted to impart 
on mm. the members? Uh, is there mm. anything that they um, that they are remembered for about the certain teachings mm. that they really found important that they wanted mm. to make sure that other people knew about? Mm. It's an interesting question. I think definitely in terms of both. I mean, in terms of Jane Wolf, for instance, she was she was very committed to to teaching Thelema and to teaching Crowley's system of of magic and and really to um, to teaching these practices the way that they had been taught by Crowley in in Europe. So in in some ways she was quite sort of I don't know to what extent she really I mean of course she she did bring her own kind of framing of some ideas into into things but in terms of um she was more kind of a um someone who brought structure and who brought systematization and who mm-hmm. brought sort of continuity basically to to teaching Crowley's system in in terms of Cameron I think she was really more concerned mostly with her own practice and her own uh, vision for for humanity than than really um, functioning as a spiritual mm. teacher for the most part. I mean, there were these experiments with this this group that I was talking about earlier, yeah. and these sex magical experiments, but that that was very sort of loose and and kind of um experimental in in various ways uh in terms of Leia one thing that's actually um that's actually interesting is that in these uh these diaries from 1924 she does try to um she she does try to write some very brief instructions sort of from the old scarlet woman to the new one and and like uh to Dorothy how she kind of has to find her own um, pathway, but once again, that wasn't something that really um, I think Dorothy paid very much attention to. One thing that Leah does write in her diaries from that period, which is actually interesting um, in terms of a project that I've been um, that I've been working with for the last few years, is that she writes that she wants her magical diaries to be um, to be published after she dies, and and during the autumn of twenty four, she thinks that is going to happen quite soon. She feels that she's at the point of death. She's emotionally and physically exhausted, and she writes to Norman Mudd that I want you to um, to preserve my diaries, and they should be they should be collected, and they should be transcribed, and they should be published with uh, uh, explanatory um, comments and, and footnotes, basically. And uh, of course. Um, she wrote this at a very particular uh, point in her life, but her idea was that uh, others would be able to study kind of the life of a Thelemite and uh, what it meant to be involved in that practice. And uh, so one of the things that I've been working on for the past few years is I'm working with uh, Henrik Bogdan, who is at the University of Gothenburg, and we're publishing Leia Hersig's Magical Diaries from the, the 1923 to 25 period with explanatory footnotes and uh, kind of uh, sorting it all out. So that's going to be published by um, Oxford University Press in the near future. So I think that's quite um, that's quite cool that she had that uh, idea yeah. at that yeah. point in time. And so nice to be able that, to do you're, that you're able to help this come to fruition. Yes, her wish. exactly. Yeah, exactly. That, imagine, it does feel nice. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I can imagine that for even though she she pretty much made a, a very definite break with the group, mm-hmm. I mm-hmm. can imagine mm-hmm. that that was such an influential time for her when she was yeah. a part of the group. Yeah, when she was active because mm-hmm. she was she was <gasps> so active. It wasn't just she was, was just a yeah. member, but mm-hmm. she was so no, active. Exactly. She was just really in the middle of mm-hmm. it all. So mm. yeah, that's really nice that it's, you're yeah. that you're working on that. That's great, and it's extremely yeah, definitely, and it's extremely. I mean, it's extremely frustrating in terms of her later life, but I, I haven't been able to find out more. So I mentioned I've been I've been interviewing relatives of hers who knew her later in life um, in uh, in Switzerland, and they say that she never they didn't know about her connection to Crowley she never talked about it so but this was very late in her life so they actually they found out um after she passed away so quite a quite a thing to discover about your family history um but 
Um, but they're very, they're very supportive and they're very sort of fascinated by her, um, by her story, um, and have a lot of empathy for, for what she went through. Um, but, but it's hard to know, like there's almost like she, she, she kind of, um, drops off the Thelemic map in, uh, in 1930 and she dies, she, she dies in 1975 and the people that I've spoken to, mostly knew her towards the end of her life. So, I mean, it, it is possible that the break was less abrupt in, in reality in, in her life, but we don't know. I think it's also interesting that she continued to travel with, uh, with Mud for quite a few years, even though they'd both severed ties with Crowley. And, and we don't really know. I've been trying to, I've been trying to trace Mud's steps as well, but it's proving proving quite a challenge but but I do find that really kind of puzzling as well how someone goes from having this very as you say this very sort of committed magical practice every day being very involved and then nothing I don't know maybe she was just that disillusioned with Mm. everything or or maybe she did continue we don't know Mm. yes this is true we don't know (laughs) Mm -hmm. so in your opinion what impact did each of these women have on their their little group and maybe even their their society that they that they lived in can mm. can we speak of mm. a legacy that has been mm. left mm. i mean i think in terms of in terms of of leia again i would say that that impact is is mostly within Thelema. Mm. Uh and she definitely had an impact there even though even though she's not always really acknowledged in in that way. But, I mean, she did make some pretty substantial contributions to to Crowley's written productions. She she transcribed large portions of his uh, his, uh, autobiography, The Confessions of Alistair Crowley. As I said, she transcribed The Diary of a Drug Fiend. She also... She assisted in the uh, the production of um, what is Crowley's lengthiest attempt at a commentary to the Book of Law, which is known as the New Comment, um, from from 1920, early 1921. She also, as I said, she also helped him produce uh, another attempted commentary to to the Book of Law in 1923 in um, in North Africa. And um, so she, she definitely had an impact in, in those terms and in terms of, of shaping that um, early Thelemic movement and uh, enabling it to function in, in those terms. I think she was really crucial. If we look at today, it's, it's interesting because I, Leia as a uh, historical person um, definitely appears to be a source of inspiration for, for some uh, occult women practitioners and, and, and Thelemites today. And, uh, and, I, and her diaries uh, are definitely important in that as well as, as kind of a record as she was really the scarlet woman who, who left um, the most substantial magical record of her own. I also think she's kind of impacted the perception of Crowley in some ways. Her his and her um, sadomasochistic sex magical experiments in the summer of 1920. I mean, that's that's really only a few weeks, but that um, that period has been very kind of um, discussed and uh, seems to be endlessly fascinating to uh, to a lot of people because, of course, it's very out there and very radical in terms of, of magical practice. So I think sometimes that that unwittingly there are some uh, aspects of, of Thelema that might have been brought a little bit more into the foreground because because of her um, participation and her sort of influence on, uh, on Crowley as well. In terms of Jane Wolfe, I mean, definitely most of her impact is within Thelema as well. And, and, and there she's had enormous impact in terms of um, creating this continuity between, between Crowley and a new generation of Thelemites and between Europe and the United States and of, of being the, the eyewitness to life at the Abbey and the way certain things were performed and, and to, to, to bringing that um, across the Atlantic. And of course, I mean, she has also had this kind of, um, she wasn't a very, she wasn't, she's not a very well remembered, re- remembered actress today, but she was fairly prolific. So mm. she's had that sort of, um, 
interesting cultural um, cultural role as well. I think Cameron is, is definitely the one who's had the widest cultural impact outside of Thelema in terms of uh, in terms of her artistic output and her of course her participation in in uh, Kenfanger's inauguration of the Pleasure Dome in in Curtis Harrington's film and and in terms of her own uh, I mean she had students of her own and uh, who were artists as well so so she's definitely had an impact there and also in terms of her sort of um, her persona and and just her kind of her magnetism, which um, which seems to have been really important as well, right? Are there? We've been hinting at this uh, for for a while now, but are there any other mm-hmm. examples of this influence uh, that can be found in pop culture that people mm-hmm. may not recognize that it stems mm-hmm. from from these women? Yeah, definitely. I mean, especially in terms of Cameron, she's been uh, she's been this kind of in the shadows of the beat movement, sort of in the, the like, oh. sort of the, the, the underground kind of art scene. So in that way she has, um, I mean, I mean, there's these very, you know, sort of frequently repeated when, when Cameron is talked about is of course the, like her being the muse to Kenneth Anger and, and like that, those aspects and her connection to um, to to others, um, well, such as such as Wallace Berman or, or Samson Debris, who was a socialite during that time, but also like much later things in terms of there was a there was a, a catwalk collection for Yves Saint Laurent. Um, I want to say seven or eight years ago uh, by Hedy Sliman, uh, which had these. Um, uh, wide-brimmed hats and long kind of uh, floaty floaty dresses, a bit gothic, a bit witchy, a bit sort of Stevie Nicks. But also there was a lot of discussion about that in, um, in, various, in various media about that collection actually being inspired by Cameron. Um, and there was also uh, Pamela, Pamela, um, Pamela Skate-Levy, I want to say, and Gina Nash, um, Taylor are also designers who founded Juicy Couture and who launched uh, their own label, Case Taylor, a few years back, which they've said explicitly was inspired by Cameron and inspired by this kind of um, occult uh, undercurrent in, in Los Angeles, which she sort of uh, encapsulated to, uh, to them. So that's probably something that's not so widely known, but how she's had this sort of lasting uh, impact. I see. That is fascinating because... I didn't mm-hmm. know that about the juicy couture. Uh, no, I didn't know uh, that. I'm learning, uh, I say it every day. It's not the brand you'd most, yeah. <laughs> I learn something new every day. It's not the brand you'd most sort of spontaneously think about no. in these, uh, <laughs> no, but in these conversations. But. <laughs> really interesting. Really interesting. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, <laughs> lastly, I'd like to ask you, mm-hmm. uh, if people are interested to, to follow your research, where can they do mm-hmm. that? Where can they best do that? Yes. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so there's Facebook. Uh, I have a page for this particular project, which is called the Thelemic Women's History Project, which people are more than welcome to follow. I'm also on Twitter and Instagram, both under the same handle, which is Dr. Underscore Scarlet Woman, and uh, where I post things um, both more formally and, and informally, but also about lectures and publications mm-hmm. and uh, and things. Yes, because you have uh, an upcoming lecture that you're giving, uh, online lecture. You want to talk about that a little mm-hmm. bit? Yes, yes, for sure. So there's actually two, but they're oh. more or less the same topic. So the first one is on... Uh, the 6th of June, which is something called Morbid Anatomy. And the second one is on the uh, 17th of uh, June, which is for something called the Last Tuesday Society, that Morbid Anatomy is based in the United States and Last Tuesday Society is based in uh, uh, in the UK. The title of that presentation or that lecture, I believe, is The Eloquent Blood, the Goddess Babylon and the Construction of Femininities in Western Esotericism, which is also the title of of my book, right. which was based on my, my PhD uh, dissertation. So that is basically the story of um, the goddess Babylon from Crowley up until today. And uh, specifically what I'm 
uh, going to be talking about um, is, and which I also looked at in the book, is how these various interpretations of Babylon, both historically and today, uh, relate to um, femininity and, and the understanding of um, femininity or, or what it means to be a woman and to, to female or feminine sexuality and how that um, also changes during this time period and how Babylon in uh, contemporary occultism to some extent has uh, uh, been articulated partly as this kind of uh, almost feminist symbol or symbol of kind of uh, a new way of of, of seeing um, and uh, and and embodying femininity. So I'm going to be tracing that um, that story in those uh, those lectures. Sounds very interesting. I will make sure that I include. Uh, either a link or uh, uh, information where people can uh, can uh, learn more about how to register if that's necessary or uh, how they mm-hmm. can uh, yep. follow that yep. and and mm-hmm. and see that presentation or those presentations I should say. Well, mm-hmm. thank you Good. so much for sharing your research with me today. I find this all to be very fascinating, and I'm so happy that you agreed to talk to me about <laughs> this because this is something that I had been really curious about, and I was trying to find a way to, to you know, facilitate <laughs> the finding out what I wanted to know. So I really appreciate thank that. Thank you. Thank you for thank you so much for inviting me. And um, yeah, this has been really absolutely a pleasure. It's been so great talking to you. I'm so glad we could uh, find the time to do this. Thanks so much. And good <laughs> luck with rounding everything up. And uh, I, I, thank will, you. <laughs> I will make sure to, uh, to keep in touch with you. And uh, whenever I of course, I don't know exactly when all of this will be published, but I will be keeping mm-hmm. an eye out for, for the end result. Okay. Cool. So thank you. Thank you again. Thank you for joining us today for this treasure trove of information. Please check out the program notes for information about Manon's upcoming lectures, her book and articles, and other relevant items that were mentioned in the interview. And be sure to follow Manon's research project on social media. I'd like to give a big shout out to all of the followers and subscribers and the wonderful comments that you've left for me. I love interacting with you and really appreciate your support. Please consider reviewing the podcast on whatever platform you listen from. I hope you'll join me next time. As always, thanks for listening.